It was November 3rd, 1991, and Blake Newsome loved his job. He had a passion for organization, an undying love of American political history, and was a lifelong member of the Republican Party. That's why he took great pride in his position as a filing clerk at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. Or at least he did, until his horrifying encounter with SCP-1981. The worst day of Blake's life began like any other. He was taking inventory of the archive's wide array of Betamax tapes and making sure that they were all arranged carefully and conformed with the filing system. One by one, he checked footage of speeches and addresses off of his list until he came upon a strange tape that had no business being there. The tape looked to be completely normal, but it hadn't been recorded on the archive inventory. And there was something else off about it. A single white sticker was on the front of the tape with Ronald Reagan cut up while talking, scrawled hastily with what was probably a felt tip marker. Blake was shocked and appalled. They hadn't even spelled the president's name correctly. What poor Mr. Newsom didn't know was that he was about to see something so disturbing that he'd look back on that misspelling like it was a treasured childhood memory. Standard policy for tapes like this would be to review and catalog, or even throw it out if necessary. Typically, a lowly filing clerk like Blake would need to seek approval from his superiors, but curiosity got the better of him. He commandeered one of the library's televisions and Betamax cassette players and started watching the footage. For the first minute or so, nothing seemed out of the ordinary. Just the president standing at the podium giving his iconic Evil Empire speech to the National Association of Evangelicals at Sheraton Twin Towers Hotel, Orlando, Florida, on March 8, 1983. However, the second the tape hit the 1 minute and 10 seconds mark, something unnatural began to occur. President Reagan's speech began to veer off as the topic of conversation shifted from the importance of family values to the exquisite taste of human flesh. Blake was taken aback. Surely he was hearing things. But the tape only got worse. President Reagan began to divulge the fact that he enjoyed the taste of young flesh the best, particularly that of infants. As Reagan began to go into detail about how exactly one should best cook an infant if you want to seal in the flavor, the crowd erupted into modest applause. Blake started to feel sick. He'd remembered watching this speech, and President Reagan had said nothing of the sort. Things only got weirder as the president's cheeks suddenly opened up into a long, bleeding gash, as though someone had cut into his face with an invisible knife. As the speech continued, and Reagan's words became more nonsensical and incoherent, the injuries got worse, too. His face developed puncture wounds, like he was being stabbed. Skin in some areas rotted and peeled off. Reagan showed no awareness of the horrifying injuries that seemed to be occurring spontaneously on his body. This was a living nightmare. The tape came to a merciful end 22 minutes in, after President Reagan's throat appeared to be slashed open and his insane speech was reduced to quiet gurgles. It fizzled out into static shortly after, and Blake politely retired to the bathroom to throw up. Was this some sick prank or tampering or camera trickery, perhaps? He didn't know, but the tape was disgusting, and whoever was responsible had to be punished. Newsom contacted the police, hoping obscenity charges could be pressed against the creator of the tape once they were found. The tape was taken into evidence, and a low-level police investigation into the possible culprits began. While the police officers who viewed the tape reported nightmares in the weeks following, the creator of the tape was never found. The investigation truly came to an end when a superior closed the case and the tape disappeared from the evidence locker. This, as you probably could have guessed, was the work of a field agent from the SCP Foundation. Anesthetics were then used to erase the memories of everyone unlucky enough to witness the tape, including Blake Newsom, who could finally rest easy and return to his filing work. The anomalous tape was now in responsible hands. It was given the designation SCP-1981 and given the object class safe due to its easily controlled and self-contained nature. Proper research and testing was now able to begin, and while nothing about the construction of the tape suggested anything inherently anomalous, repeat viewings of the video made it clear that this went far beyond mere doctored footage of a presidential speech. Every single time the tape is played, both the speech made and the injuries received by President Reagan change. The few rules the tape seemed to always follow are that Reagan never reacts to the injuries he's receiving, it always has the same beginning and total runtime, and the speech is always corrupted. The speeches have been described as mostly incoherent, lacking any sort of underlying thematic structure, 
and largely being composed of nonsensical anecdotes and parables. So not that dissimilar from a regular Reagan speech, but the topics always turn incredibly dark and have included torture, mutilation, death, cannibalism, ritual sacrifice, genocide, and more. The range of injuries shown on President Reagan in the videos have included, but are by no means limited to, impalement, mutilation, and some tortures so gruesome that the details have been redacted from official files. On several occasions, the details of President Reagan's speech have also eerily predicted the future. These include successfully predicting the September 11th attacks in 2001 and the outcome of the 2008 Russian presidential election. Incidentally, this isn't even the only Reagan-related SCP to predict the future. No, there's another entity in this incredibly specific niche, SCP-095, a highly degraded copy of a comic known as The Atomic Adventures of Ronnie Reagan. The title character bears a striking resemblance to President Reagan, despite the fact that the comment is confirmed by Foundation Tests to have been written in the early 1930s. The comic is set in the far-off future world of the 1980s and follows a number of Ronnie's exploits in three stories. The first, titled Ronnie vs. Space Admiral Carter, seems to perfectly describe the events of the 1980 presidential election. The second, Space Assassin, mirrors the attempted assassination of President Reagan by John Hinckley Jr. And the third, titled Jungle Planet, retells the Iran-Contra controversies of 1986. These comics were produced under the mysterious and apparently non-existent company, Future Funnies. The Foundation hopes to track down the other comics from this company whenever possible, but they've had no luck on that front. For now, there's only SCP-095. During initial testing, Foundation staff watched the tape frequently in case this strange, corrupted version of President Reagan had any other valuable predictions for the future. However, during one of these screenings, one of the D-Class observation personnel pointed and yelled at the screen in horror. Upon further examination of recorded footage, researchers could see exactly what had concerned the D-Class observer so much. While in other viewings of the tape, President Reagan's press detail had appeared totally normal, in this one something was clearly amiss. Standing among the other dull, suit-wearing political aides was a tall figure dressed in a midnight black cloak with a large conical hood obscuring his face. The figure didn't appear to move in the footage, it just stood there, menacingly. A later survey indicated that this figure would appear in roughly one in seven viewings of the tape. This cloaked figure was designated SCP-1981-1, and he became part of the reoccurring imagery in the nightmares that often followed a viewing of SCP-1981. Naturally, despite containment and preservation attempts, the Foundation was aware that just like any normal tape, natural magnetic interference would eventually degrade it beyond use. Attempts to copy the footage onto another Betamax tape failed to reproduce the anomalous effects. That's why the Foundation has painstakingly recorded any video and audio they could via a standard commercial camcorder. In one particularly terrifying playback, SCP-1981-1 took the President's place at the podium, staring directly into the camera. The words, I see you, appeared over a black screen shortly after. Staff members were ordered never to make an attempt at communicating with the figure, and instead contact a level 4 superior if such an event occurs during a playback again. The frightening and unfortunate effects of SCP-1981 would come to their logical conclusion under the watchful eye of Dr. James Kyle Robinson, managing archivist of inert safe class objects and anomalous items at Site-73. He was contacted by Special Agent Arnold Rodriguez and Special Agent Ethan Tate, members of the Secret Service with a duty to protect President Reagan. Word had gotten to Reagan that there was an anomalous artifact in the possession of the Foundation that directly pertained to him, and he wanted to see it. Dr. Robinson obtained files and transcripts pertaining to SCP-1981 and handed them over to the agents, but refused to allow President Reagan to see the tape directly without approval from O5 Command. Mm -hmm but Reagan and the agents were persistent. Eventually, O5 Command ordered a private screening of the tape for President Reagan at the Sanford Chemical Processing Plant, a front business owned and operated by the Foundation for Amnestic Production. Dr. Robinson offered President Reagan the use of amnestics after the session completed, but Reagan declined. The screening took place in Conference Room B, and the tape was replayed three times. It was on the third playback that things took an interesting turn. 
As the mutilated Reagan on the screen began to rant about drinking the blood of a child from the skull of Vladimir Putin, Reagan began to silently mouth along the words as though he remembered them. He spoke about beings known as the Destroyers and potential apocalyptic events to come. After the screening, Reagan once again refused the offer of amnestics and departed. It seemed as though all was well, until a violent break-in at the Sanford chemical processing plant that left a night guard dead. A large number of amnestics had been stolen during the break-in, and security footage showed that Agent Tate and Rodriguez had been responsible. The two agents were tracked down and traced to the residence of Ronald Reagan, where the Foundation came upon a disturbing sight. The agents had pillaged large quantities of Class A and B amnestics and supplied them to President Reagan, who, at some point after observing SCP-1981, had been driven into a dangerous madness. The two agents wanted to cure him before he caused harm to himself or others, but their bungling had come with severe consequences. Misapplying such a high quantity of amnestics had essentially destroyed Reagan's mind, and while the Foundation was able to stabilize his condition, his impaired memory and cognitive function would leave him unable to care for himself independently. In order to cover up for this grievous mistake, a cover story was concocted about Reagan falling victim to Alzheimer's and facing severe cognitive decline as a result. Both agents Tate and Rodriguez were fired for their actions, had their memories wiped by the Foundation, and were assigned new identities. Dr. Robinson, for his part in the disaster, had to face a Foundation Ethics Committee disciplinary hearing. While SCP-1981 continues to be classified as safe due to its unlikeliness to ever breach containment, when you consider the havoc it wrought on the mind of its singular target, safe is hardly the word that comes to mind. It's enough to make you wonder what other tapes are lurking out there just waiting to be found.